just need someone to talk to. And he's always there to hear my prayer each time I call him. All my needs, he will supply my thirsty soul. He satisfies and he's the Lord of all. And he's all I need. He comforts me. soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. He's my everything. He's all I need. He's all I need. I will not turn to any other. Closer than any brother. On this friend, I will rely to be my strength as life goes by, and he's the Lord of all, and he's all I need. He comforts me. soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. He's my everything. He's all I need. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. He's my everything. He's all I need. He's my everything. He's all I need. All right, we will dismiss the little guys eight and under. They can go to their class. And if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Deuteronomy 33. And we are in verse 20, the tribe of Gad. Deuteronomy 33, verse 20. And of Gad, he said... Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. And he provided the first part for himself, because there in a portion of the lawgiver was he seated. And he came with the heads of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage. And we pray, Lord, uh, once again, Lord, that you would make it live and you'd make it um, something, Lord, that would help every one of us, Lord, this day. Lord, breathe on it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The blessing of Gad. 
You know, uh, and, and of Gad, he said, blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. And that obviously is some sort of a, a, a military reference. Uh, you know, um, um, it's uh, we we talked about um, uh, Zebulun last week and his goings out. And there was there was a reference to his military exploits. And you see that with Gad also. But but he's. He's also um, he's referring to something future, but he also refers to something he did. And that's in the second verse there. Uh, verse 21, he provided the first part for himself because there in a portion of the lawgiver was he seated. That's a reference to, um, you know, the children of Israel. Uh, they were going through the wilderness. They hadn't crossed the Jordan yet. They hadn't come into the promised land yet. But just when they came up, you know, just before they got to the Jordan, you know, uh, Reuben, Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh, decided that man this this land right here is this is a beautiful piece of land and we've got a lot of cattle and um and they went to moses the lawgiver and they were the first to do this and they said moses can we just have this piece of land here instead of inheriting on the other side of jordan and uh you know there was some dispute about, about all that in numbers 32 and uh, at first, Moses thought their motives were very suspect. You got to remember, he had by this time he had wandered through the wilderness with these folks for a long time, so he was suspicious of them often. And um, he said, "What are you guys doing?" He said, "You're are you trying to get out of of going to battle with the rest of your brethren? Are you trying to get out of of going over into Canaan land and fighting with the rest of the tribes of Israel?" And that's where that famous verse appears. He says, "If you will not cross over." He said, be sure your sin will find you out. And Gad said, no, Reuben and Gad and, and Manasseh, they said, no, 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 no. That's not what we're after. They said, if it's okay with you, Moses, they said, we want to inherit on this side of Jordan. We love this beautiful piece of pasture land that's here. So how about we just quickly build some houses for our children, our wives, our little ones, our, our, our the animals that we have, and um, we'll get them situated quickly. And then we'll go over, all our men will go over into Canaan land and we will fight the battles of the Lord with them until they were completed. Now, what they didn't know was, I'm sure they had some idea because, you know, we're in this age where everything moves fast, you know, but nothing moved fast then. But that was life for them. They, you know, they didn't live at the pace of the pace we live at is so foreign to them. They, they wouldn't have a clue what to do with it. But when they said, we're going to go over. They were that was a five year commitment. They didn't know it at the time, but it would be five years before the land was subdued. It wasn't totally conquered, but it was subdued. And then uh, Joshua could send them away and go back to their wives and their children. So in the second verse there, you see a reference to them giving a portion of land by the lawgiver. So uh, that's and then he says. And look at look at the second part of that verse, verse uh, 21. And he came, he came with the heads of the people. He came with all the other tribes. He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. You know, uh, what happened in Canaan wasn't just God, you know, giving them a piece of real estate. Uh, that was part of it. But part of it was God executing his judgment on those lands of Canaan because they were filled with the most perverse, bloody, terrible abominations on the planet. And the Lord had announced hundreds of years before that he was coming, but he gave him 400 years of grace. And then, man, he they came in and they, they cleared out that land. Um, and so the reference is, uh, blessed be Gad, because he, he did what he said he would do. He actually went in with the rest of the tribes at great cost to himself, at great loss to himself, and he fulfilled his commitment to see that thing through, and he, he accomplished, and he did what he said he would do. Have you ever thought about how uncommon that is? With God's people. God hears us say all sorts of stuff. And, and through the years, God's hear, God hears his people say all sorts of stuff to him. And God has a blessing for the people that will do for him 
what they said they would do. But I want to draw your attention, first of all, to the first part of the verse. It's a very soft, cushy part there. It says, he dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. Um, wow, that's rough. Blessed be he that enlarged Gad. He said Gad was going to be enlarged. And God said, uh, you know, he said, I'm, I'm going to create an atmosphere around Gad. He said, I'm going to bless everyone that helps Gad. And he said, um, he dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. Any way you slice it, that's pretty gruesome. He, he teareth the arm with the crown of the head. I want you to keep your place there, but, you know, stick a piece of paper or something there. And just, if you can, look at a few verses with me. Look at Matthew 11. The first thing he mentions about Gad would be his military exploits. He said, he'll be like a lion and he will tear the arm with the crown of the head. Matthew 11. And from the days, um, Matthew 11, Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. You know, um, the Lord says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 12, he says, fight the good fight of faith. And if he just said it once, you know, you could, you could, you know, maybe somehow, you know, soften that statement down. But, you know, um, when you when you read the Bible and you you look at all the times our Lord made statements like this. You go to Ephesians 6, and, and he says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, you know, when the Lord said that, um, you know, it wasn't because, you know, he was going to take pictures for a museum exhibit. Um, you know, you put, it, put, on, put on the whole armor of God. Um, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And then he mentions having your loins covered, a breastplate, having your feet covered, having a shield, having a helmet having a sword and, and he writes that to us um, fight the good fight of faith and when he says that he is not encouraging unchrist likeness you know man it, it just you know there's all sorts of extremes and um, and one of the extremes that's out there is is people somehow become very unchristlike, and they do it on the side of right, you know. And um, but the Lord here is not when He tells us to fight the good fight of faith. He's not telling us to be brash, or brassy, or rough. You know, the Lord said in First and Second Peter, He said, "Not rendering railing for railing." In other words, it's assumed people are going to rail on us. Rail means to use abusive language. Okay, we all know what that is. Okay, uh, and he says, not rendering railing for railing. He said in another place to be courteous to all men. You know, some read this thing of fight the good fight. And when some people read it, it's, it's an encouragement to them um, to be rude, to be ready to correct everybody, to call folks down, you know, to be arrogant in Jesus' name to be sharp-tongued, it becomes an excuse for ugliness. But that's not what our Lord had in mind. We're, you know, it, the Christian life is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And, uh, and, and we're supposed to be like him, are we not? Um, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Um, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. So when the Lord says fight the good fight, he's not, uh, he's not encouraging us to, you know, we, the world has an expression, you know, you know, uh, fighting fire with fire. Well, the Christian life is 
a fight. And it is a fight. And it is a fight. And the Lord said, blessed be he that enlarged Gad. He, he was blessing Gad. This was the blessing of Gad. There is a blessing for those that will fight the good fight. That doesn't mean this thing about being, you know, like Christ. It doesn't mean there's never a time to rebuke someone or never, never time that you don't defend something. But in the world, in our dealings with people, what did our Lord say we were to be like? He told his disciples, he said, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. And, you know, we were talking about this the other day in Acts chapter 20. Paul's talking to the um, the elders at Ephesus, and he said, after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you. And we were talking about how, um, you know, there's a guy that wrote a book, and it's called The Wolves in Your Church. It's just a little book. The guy did a pile of research. And he said, it is striking, um, and it's no accident that the Lord used wolves in that passage. And when you begin to understand the behavior of wolves, even in the wild, you begin to understand their behavior. Then you begin to understand how some people do what they do. Um, you know, the Lord um, called us lambs. You know, not police dogs, not wolves, not snakes, not bulls. He sent us forth as lambs. Look at Jesus Christ. Look at the apostles, even in very difficult people situations. And they had lots of those. Um, what came to mind was Acts 16, Paul and Silas, they've been arrested and um, they've been whipped and they're thrown in prison. And um, at, at midnight, they were singing praises to God. You know, um, when this chapter moves towards its end and the, the jailer comes out and he says, he says, you know, he says, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to send you on your way. And then Paul does politely address the fact, he says, you understand that you beat us and we are Romans. And so he politely addresses that. And he says, why don't you have the officials come and get us out? But but you don't see Paul and here, here or Silas in the midst of this whole event, you know, as they're being dragged off and as they're about to be whipped. You ought to read, it's first or second Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, I believe it's second. And Paul begins to list all his sufferings. And Paul said five times, Received I 40 stripes, save one. 40 stripes, save one means 39 stripes. Um, the Jews had a law that, you know, one of their maximum penalties that they could inflict on someone is they were, they would, they could give them 40 stripes with a whip. You know, that was on their bare back. Uh, a lot of people died under that event, as you can imagine. 40 stripes with a whip. And these weren't kindergartners that were swinging the whip. These were bulls of men that had no compassion. And um, Paul said, I've been through this five times now. Can you imagine trip number four and they're tying him to the post? And he's going, oh, dear God, not again. So at the end of this ordeal, he does go and says, uh, you know, you know, we're Romans. But as they're tying him and Silas to the post, and as they're in prison, and as they're in agony, there's no mention of lawyers. There's no mention of suing. There's no mention of jailbreak. They're not screaming. They're not fussing at the other prisoners. No. Do you know why? Because they were lambs. And this wasn't about them. This was about shining for Jesus Christ. And they understood that. There is a spiritual warfare that goes on all around us, and it, it may have been present at your house this morning. Man, some of you, you you know, we, we were joking, Andreas and I were talking the other night, um, and I just heard it from somebody else the other day. Um, you, you know, I'm sure the devil visits some of your homes on Saturday, on Saturday, on a Saturday night. Uh, he often is at our house, and every once in a while on a Saturday night, all hell's breaking loose. And I mean, you know, I'm going to make this up, okay? But you'll get the idea. The furnace quits, and then the fridge quits, and then the, the plumbing springs a leak, and and then you get, you know, and, and all that stuff. And we all look at each other and we go, "It's Saturday," because we know what's going on. Because it, it didn't happen on Tuesday. 
It never happens on Tuesday. Uh, you know, it might have been Sunday morning. You're, you're in that rush and the, the stress is building. You're trying to get out the door. And, and, um, and boy, this ought to be. And it's been sweet already. I mean, the God has already manifested his presence and the singing. It's just been wonderful. But, you know, um, you know, this is the this is the place where where we we come in and enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And you know what the devil does? Whoa, he's trying to he's trying to really stifle that just as you're getting out of the house, man. He's trying to swing the emotions into the red zone. It's, it's a spiritual warfare. Why does he do that? Because he knows what's getting ready to happen. We could look at a lot of references, and you don't need to turn there, but in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel has been praying, and he's been praying for 21 days, and suddenly an angel shows up and says, Daniel, we heard you the first day, but he said, but in a, the, the prince of Persia stopped us and we were there with him for 21 days. And then he, he tells, he tells him what he's going to do. And he says, and when I leave, and this is the wording, the angel says, the angel says, I must fight with the prince of Grecia. Okay. That's a principality. That's a, a ruler. And, you know, Satan has Ephesians six principalities. There's demons. You know, you pray demons at your house this morning. You might've had them last night. They might've been keeping you away and all that stuff. And uh, you got some even now, you know, they're going to they're going to make you notice so They're Hopefully, ladies, they won't make any of you get your fingernail clippers out or or, you know, or you're going to you're going to you're going to notice this little person over here and how they've got a piece of hair out of the way. And the devils are maybe around you right now. You know, there's warfare going on. And there's angels and devils, and it's not just about us, it's even about them. In the Old Testament, we see the visual of that warfare. Um, in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is full of this. Man, the battle was physical. It was primarily outward. It was against physical enemies. And one of the things you notice if you read your Bible is that God spares no visual. I mean, you can't miss it. It's just blood and guts all the way. It really is. I mean, there's folks getting hit by the archers. There's people hanging on trees, swinging from the trees. There's people getting dashed on rocks. There's people getting whipped with whips. There's people getting hewed in pieces. There's people getting besieged and starving to death. And, and, and of course, we've all got that wonderful story that we tell our kids about David and Goliath. And I had a friend of mine. He said uh, every once in a while he'd go in his kid's bedroom before he prayed with them at night. He had three little boys. And he said, uh, he said so before, before I pray with you tonight, he, once in a while he'd do this. He'd say, what story do you want me to tell you? And they would always say, David and Goliath. So he'd tell them the whole story, and he'd purposely stop after, you know, he throws it, and, you know, and boom, Goliath hits ground, and he'd stop. And they'd say, no, Daddy, tell the rest, tell the rest. <laughs> you know, that's where David takes Goliath's sword and cuts his head off. It's in the Bible. You ought to read it sometime. Cuts his head off. And, and, and if that weren't enough, he takes his head and marches off to Saul and says, look what I found. Do you realize God spares no visual? And it's funny how Christians are, you know, and I, I realize some of you are very diligent and some of you are, some of you are not what I'm about to describe. But it is amazing the things that you can watch on TV and yet you get squeamish when somebody describes this. It is absolute unbridled hypocrisy. Now, I know some of you don't watch bad stuff, but some of you. And you know what the Lord does? The Lord spares no visual about warfare in the Bible because he wants to show the reality of the conflict. The nature, the intensity of the conflict. You know, in battle, it is life or death. And we've said this before, but... You know, it, it really, it's helpful if you think about what you're reading and you're picturing it. You know, uh, you've got, you know, I believe it was Shammah that killed 800 men with an ox goad. Okay, it's a sharp stick. Okay. And um, one man kills 800. So here's my point. Do you realize that every time, you know, he, he comes up and I, I don't know why, I don't know if the army retreated and he got stuck in a hole somewhere. 
but but he's taken on, and the whole thing is supernatural. There's no way on earth one man is going to defeat 800 men. I mean, all they got to do is rush you, and it's not like he had a machine gun or hand grenades or, or you know, all, he had a sharp stick. You know, we you know we we talk about heroes, man. Those guys, they they were on a whole nother plane. They were on another plane, and he's fighting this battle. And do you realize that every time he squared off with somebody, one of them was going to die. Every time David and his men, they go into these battles and, and these battles, they, you know, these guys are swinging these swords and you would have multiple encounters that went on for hours and hours and hours. The length of these battles was incredible. And every time you squared off with the next guy, one of you was going to die. You imagine getting through a battle and go, wow, I made it. You know, uh, the Lord... All these things were written, the Bible says, for our examples. And it's to show the life or death nature, your spiritual warfare that is going on in your life. And I don't necessarily mean something demonic, but your spiritual warfare that's going on in your life, it is a life or death. It's a life or death thing. I mean, uh, if, if you don't make it, like if you just chuck this whole business one day you or, or you just get really comfortable and you just decide, I'm, I'm really not going to be serious about this anymore. Somebody's going to die. You say, what do you mean? Oh, oh, your, your spiritual connection to God's going to die. Your prayer life is going to die. Your kids are going to die. There's, there's going to be some loss. It's life or death. It's kill or be killed. And the Lord says, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. It's interesting. God does not God does not hesitate to use that military illustration. Do you know what the name of our Lord is? Many, 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 many times. I think it's it's a couple hundred times. He's called the Lord of Hosts. You know what? You know what? That, how that term is used in the Old Testament? It's always a military, almost always, with the exception of a few passages. It talks about the host of Midian and the host of the Amalekites, and he says, "I'm the Lord of Hosts." Revelation 19 talks about the armies in heaven and that's future and that's coming back and that's us coming back with him one day when everything really gets all squared away. The armies in heaven, Daniel 4 talks about the armies of heaven. You know, sometimes when you talk about these things, um, um, and we don't, we don't often, but some people have have a hard time with this stuff. And yet, you know what the Lord says about us in James four, he said, ye fight in war. He said, ye fight in war, yet you have not because yeah. From whence come wars and fightings amongst you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Yeah, you're not, you're not swinging a physical sword, but, um, but the Lord said, we fight in war. Did you, ever, did you ever find that the Bible says something that you don't like? Did you ever find that? Somebody said this. I don't know who. If God always agrees with you, then you are your own God. Do you ever read something in the Bible you don't like? The Bible says, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For their foolishness unto him. Wow, there is a wrestling match sometimes, isn't there? You you read the Bible, and you know there's some things you're great with, some things you don't have a struggle with. Our, our, every one of us in this room, you know, we've got our strengths and our weaknesses, and um, and everybody struggles in a different area. And um, wow, sometimes there's a wrestling match, and you'll be reading something in the Bible. And um, you ever read something you didn't like? I've seen it on people's faces. I don't see it a whole lot, but I've seen it on people's faces. And man, sometimes you just touch on something and, and um, <clears throat> you can see it on their face. Sometimes there is a truth that's hard to swallow and it, and it goes against everything in them. Haven't you found it so? Haven't we all? 
But often that is the line where victory is going to be won or lost. And when you hit those places in the Bible, here's what you what you come down to. Will I force the scripture to agree with me? And will I make it sound spiritual? That's really one of the most deadly deceptions of all. You know, Satan appeared to tempt the Lord Jesus and, you know, it's Satan himself. And what does he do? He quotes scripture. He quotes scripture. Um, will I force the scripture to agree with me? Will I imagine that it agrees with me? Will I modify it so it agrees with me? Or will I just face it honestly and say, God, I don't like this, but I can see it with my own eyes. I know it's true. Lord, this, I've got to deal with this. And Lord, I hate this. And Lord, it's in me. And I've got a problem. And Lord, I, I, this isn't the way I was raised, God. And Lord, I, but I want to do what you want me to do. And boy, you start fighting that battle on your knees. You know, the Lord likes that. You come, you're being honest. You're praying about your sanctification. And what was it Jesus prayed for us? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And you're begging God to work in your heart. David prayed. And I don't, I don't have a Calvinist bone in my body. I do not. But David prayed. And of course, he wasn't talking about his salvation. But David had some issues. And he recognized them. And in one place, he says, Turn us, oh God, turn us. He said, Lord, we need to turn around, but we're going to need some serious help here. He says, in another place, hold thou me up. He prayed in another place, keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. He says, Lord, he said, there's some sins that are going to ruin me. He says, Lord, help me stay back from that line. You know why he was praying that? Because there was a war going on in his heart. Will I be honest and, and, and say, God, I really want you to, I, I want to be like your son. And be not, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You know, the good news is, uh, God, this is something God is in. God wants he which hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And God is at work in you if you're a believer. And uh, boy, when you come to the place where you say, Lord, I really do want to be like you. You know what? God's going to work. This thing of... Um, the verse, the scripture you don't like. This is the line where victory is won or lost. This is the line where progress is determined. You know, a lot of Christians, they, they do well for a while. And, and you know what happens? You know what happens? God deals with them. And they're, they're a babe. And God deals. And when they get newly saved, they're like a babe. And what do you do with the babe? You know, we got babies in here. I got to see my, my grand, one of my grandbabies last night. And you just hold it. And you love on it. And you feed it. And you laugh at it and you talk to it. And um, but you know what? You know what? You get you get a few years down the road, and and um, man, there's you're expecting some things, you're teaching them some things, and slowly but surely you're expecting more and you're expecting more and you're expecting more, and there's growth, and then then they get those years where they're maturing, and you're expecting to see some sh some responsibilities. And boy, and all through those years, there's things that that you as a parent are going to have to force on them because it's not in them. It's not in them. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe your Johnny will love homework. Most kids do not. You know, maybe your Johnny will love to clean up his room. Most Johnnies do not. You know, and, and all these things, and, and there, there comes this place where a battle line is drawn. And you know what? Their whole future is going to ride on that battle line. If you don't, if you, what's God say? First Corinthians nine, Paul said, boy, another illustration. He says, so fight I. And then he says, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul said, there's a fight going on. Paul, 
greatest Christian ever lived. He said, man, he says, I got a battle going on. He says, I fight. And he says, I'm not beating the air. He said, my biggest enemy, he said, the guy I'm fighting a lot is me. He said, I'm trying to bring me in. And see, see, some of us as adults, you know, we're struggling. And why are we struggling? Because there's some things in our youth that really would have been nice if somebody had got that out of our system. You know what, parents? That's your job. That's your job. And a battle line is drawn. It's going to be a battle for you. Are you going to take on that battle? Let not thy soul spare for his crying, the wise man said. Will you take on that battle? Or are you going to coddle it and just let it go and reinforce the evil that one day they'll be angry with you for? That will wreak havoc on their marriage and their relationships because you didn't take care of it. And even in their own nature, you know, you're doing them a favor because they've got to wrestle now because, man, you're pressing something on them that they don't want to deal with. And you're forcing something into their life that they don't want. And, man, that battle starts raging in them. And you know what? You're doing them a favor because you're setting the stage for later on when you won't be there. And then they'll have to fight their own battles. You know, it would be nice if they learned it here and not here. It would be nice. Man, there's a war going on. We all look nice. Everybody smells nice this morning. Everybody's just smiling. But there's a war going on. And there's some battle lines. Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. Gad would take up the sword and he would not shrink back from the battle. He says he's going to tear the arm and he's going to he's going to tear the crown of the head. He, God said he's flat, going to get with it. And God said, blessed. God said he's going to fight the battle. Are you going to fight the battle? That's the line where sweetness rests. There's a line. Man, there's sweetness. There's peace. And a lot of times, God, what do you say? Do you, do you love life and want to see good days? He said, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. He said, seek peace and pursue it. He doesn't mean peace at any price. He means the peace that comes five years into the land of Canaan. Blood and guts all the way. And finally, peace. Peace. That's the line where relief is and joy is found. Will you fight this morning? And that's really the question. I, I If you forget everything else I say, and, and there's some encouraging thoughts. I, again, um, he saw it through and God blessed everyone that helped him fight. Maybe you're going to help somebody else fight. God said, blessed be he that enlargeth Gad. He said, I'm going to bless Gad and I'm going to bless all the folks that help Gad. Maybe you're going to help somebody else win the victory. God says, I'll, I'll bless you too. I'll bless you too. Will you fight? There's a song we heard a lot of years ago in, in the, the chorus goes, tell me who's going to fight and who's giving in. Who's going to lose and who's going to win? Will you cry, I surrender, when the enemy you meet? Or will you be a soldier standing on your feet? Are you going to fight? And right about this time, you know, there's always somebody that's read the Deeper Life books. And I love the Deeper Lifers. I've read their stuff. Man, I, 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 I swam in those waters for years. And then you'll, you'll hear this. You'll say, oh, preacher. No, preacher, that, that's not the way it goes. It's, it's, um, it's not trying. It's trusting. It's not striving. It's resting. And the problem with that is that statement is incomplete. And it is very misleading. Look at any of the Christians in the New Testament. Look at Paul. Man, he waded through battle, fears, turmoil, struggles. What about strive to enter into the straight gate? What about strive together in your prayers for me? What about, and if a man strive for masteries, um, yeah, it's trusting, and yes, it's resting the Lord, but it's both. It's both. Will you fight? 
Many of you are. And I say it in a good way. Many of you are. And many of you have fought. Praise the Lord. And that's why you're still here. And that's why you've made it this far. Some of you have won some victories. And God only knows. There's some victories. Some of you guys have fought behind closed doors. Nobody knows. They're too personal to talk about. And you guys have done amazing. And that's why you've made some decisions for you and your kids. And it's wonderful to see. But the battle's not over. It's not over. I ask you this morning, maybe everybody's marriage is heavenly this morning. And I say, I hope it is. I really do. But will you fight for your marriage? All I know is I got some friends. I got some good Christian friends that I never thought would throw in the towel. I never even knew they were even having grief. And they're not married today. And man, they, not only are they not married. Wow. They have went haywire. Will you, will you fight for your marriage? I got word just a week or so ago about another one of my friends and his wife is secretly planning to leave him. You say, how did you find out, Pastor? Because of a connection to his family that, you know, be careful who you're, who you're telling your family because they let the cat out of the bag. And she's planning on leaving her husband and he doesn't even know. I'll tell you this about that woman. I know her well. She's never fought for her marriage. Only she, the only thing she ever fought for was herself. I got a question for you this morning. And God in heaven is the one that wants to know the answer. Are you going to fight for your marriage? You know, nothing good comes easy. Will you fight for your children? Will you fight for your loved ones? I mean, in prayer. Will you fight to go against the tide? Will you fight for your Bible reading and fight for your prayer life? I will never forget it as long as I live. I was driving through Prince Albert when I passed her there, and it was an evening, and I just turned the Christian radio station on, and I never listened to that station. I just, and not because it was terrible or anything, I just never did. And but that night it was late. I just turned the radio on, and um, it was some guy that I would normally not not listen to. Like he's just not, he's just not my bag of chips, you know. And I thought, and but uh, boy, he grabbed me. I turned it on. And he said, he said, you know, he said, some of you, he said, he said, you, you need to, he said, your devotional life is hurting. And he said, he said, let me tell you what you're going to have to do. He said, you're never going to have time. When he said that, man, he caught my attention. You know how it is. Life gets busy, doesn't it? He said, you're never going to have time. He said, if you want to have a time with God, your prayer life, your Bible reading, he said, you're going to have to steal it from something else. He said, just mark it down. He said, something else will suffer if you put God first. And he says, just remember, that's how you put God first. I thought, wow. You have to fight for that. You know, if you want it to be more than five minutes, and thank you, Lord, and bless the missionaries in Jesus' name. If you want it to be more than that, you're going to have to fight for that. Are you going to fight? To purposely speak to others about Jesus Christ. You know, you know, I don't mean some, you know, oh, it, it's a sunny day and the man upstairs sure gave us a nice day. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you purposely at least taking a few words. I'm not saying you got to corner him and preach to him for an hour. I'm not saying you got to talk to him for 10 minutes. But will you say something that you use the name of Jesus Christ and you talk about how he died for them and rose from the dead? That took me less than 15 seconds to say that. Had a friend of mine. He's walking down the street. And there was an outdoor outdoor thing. You know you know how the restaurants do in the summertime. They'll have an outdoor um, sort of court area on the sidewalk. And um, this guy was a good guy. He witnessed people. He talked to people about the Lord. And he said, I walked by. And he said, I felt, I felt impressed. To, there was a couple sitting there at a the table. And he said, I didn't have much time. And I said, I could tell they were probably engaged in a serious conversation. He said, but God said, say something. And he said, I went up to him and I said, hey, guys, you don't know me and I don't know you. But I said, I just want you to know God loves you and Jesus Christ died for you. And he walked off. You say, well, what good did that do? I, I tell you what good it did. I bet they were still hearing that in their head when they went to bed that night because that doesn't happen every day. Are you going to fight for your health? A lot of you are. And, um, you know, there's some health issues you can't fix. And, and I know old age comes and all that. But but you know what I have seen? 
I've seen a lot of people that they just sort of lay down and die because they love their fork. Paul said, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Will you fight for your health? Will you fight to stay clean? Will you fight to keep the evil out of your media and out of your eyes and out of your heart? It will be a fight because you have an enemy. The Bible says your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeketh, seeking whom he may devour. It says in the book of Revelation, they overcame him. That's the devil. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Gad would see it through all the way till the end. Moses said, you guys trying to get out of this? I, I think God would ask a lot of Christians in 2024. Are you guys trying to get out of this? He, he, some, some Christians, he'd ask that. And Gad said, oh, Moses, no, no, no. He said, we'll see it through to the end. And God said, bless Gad. Because it wasn't just for Gad. It was for his brothers in Christ and his sisters in Christ. Will you fight this morning? If you're going to make it, we all want to get to the other side. I heard a guy say this. He said, uh, he said, you know, a lot of Christians that he knew, he, they would come up to him and they would say, well, preacher, I just want to hear God say, well done. And he said, that's a good thing. But he said, but the people that usually said that, they really weren't doing much. And he said, um, he said, you realize he's not going to say well done unless you've done well. And how is that? Do we win every battle? No. Do we do, do, we do everything perfectly? No, we don't. We, and, you know, we a just man falls seven times and rises up again. But Paul comes to his final hour and he looks back. And you know what you're going to do? If the rapture doesn't catch us totally by surprise, if you wind up, like I just got a report, another, another old friend last week, you know, terminal cancer, you know, and they're starting down that road. You know, if you have a chance to look back, you're going to look back and you're going to think. And Paul is in his final hours. And he says, I have fought a good fight. And if you can say that, will you win every battle? Nope. Will you have done it all right? Nope, you won't. Uh, there'll, there'll always be a lot that you'll wish you'd done different. They'll, you'll always cringe over the time that you lost. No, you'll always do that. But if you can look back, hey, listen, if God gives you another year, if God gave John the Baptist six months, six months, John the Baptist had. And God said, that's enough. He's the greatest man that's been born of woman. Six months. You know, the devil gets on your shoulders. See, he's your adversary. He's not always blowing up your fridge and your furnace. Sometimes he's just whispering to your ear. What a failure you are and how you don't have enough time and you can't make up for all. Well, we're not trying to make up for the past. Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing toward the mark, looking unto Jesus. What, what if he gives you another year? What if he gives us 10 more years? You know what you could do? You could make the devil wish he hadn't. You could fight a good fight. You say, man, I haven't done so well. Well, join the club. But you know what? The Lord, Micah 7, he delighteth in mercy. And he loves his people. And he loves to bless his people. And he says, you know what? He says, would you join in the fight? He says, I have a blessing waiting. Don't be discouraged. Pick up your sword. Start again and fight. Let's pray. Man, there's some things worth fighting for. Father, bless your truth in Jesus' name. If God has spoken to you this morning. Why don't you talk to him? Why don't you why don't you re-enlist? Why don't you say, Lord, I, I sort of put my sword down somewhere, but Lord, if if you'll let me, I'll pick it back up again.
The Lord's our captain. He'd be glad to have you on board. Lord, thank you for your book, and Lord, thank you for the truth, and Lord, thank you, God, that we're on the winning side, and Lord, someday the battles will all be over, and it'll be peace forevermore. God, thank you, Lord, that you are with us, and Lord, this is your battle, and, and Lord, you let us be part of what you're trying to do. Lord, would you help us? Lord, everything in the world works to discourage us and to uh, tone us down and to get us to back off. Lord, in Jesus' name, may we be stirred, Lord, just to follow you, Lord, with all our heart and to not settle for something less than you want us to settle for. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.